hello. My name is Jonathan Page, and I am one of the pastors at Herndon United Methodist Church. And I am so thrilled that we are joining together to have a time of worship. And you're a part of it. That's good news. That warms my heart. I know that wherever you are and however you are, you may have been through a lot. You may not be going through much at all right now. But hey, for these few moments, we are gathered together to praise God's holy name. And I think that's really good news. So thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of today's worship service. Wherever you are and however you are, I'd ask that you take a moment uh, right now and just hop in those comments and let us know that you're watching today's service, who you are, maybe who you're watching with and where you're watching from. Also, I want to invite you to take a peek at our e-bulletin. The e-bulletin will guide you through all that's going to happen in today's worship service. You can access that at herndonumc.org or by clicking the link that is in the comments right now that can direct you, direct you directly to that e-bulletin. More than anything, friends, what I want you to know is that I don't think it's a mistake that we're together for this time. Whether you're watching live or later on Facebook or on YouTube or connecting in some other way, I think that God has ordained this time for a purpose. And I believe that we're going to get something out of worshiping God together today. So I can't wait to get this started. I'm going to pray for us so we can get on with it. Uh, as we prepare to get on with it, what I want to invite you to do is to, to stand wherever you are and sing wherever you are as you are able to be in the comments today and be an active participant in the worship conversation, to do whatever it is that you might need to do to grow closer to God and to God's love today. So let's pray together and then let's worship God. Would you join me as we pray? God, we are here gathered from all sorts of different places and all sorts of different perspectives, but God, we're here right now, ready to praise you, ready to give you glory. And so, God, I ask that you would free us from distractions, free us from whatever it is that may be keeping us from seeing you. And, and God, would you allow this time to be yours? Would you allow us to be yours? God, would you allow the whole of your creation to be yours? We offer ourselves this time and this space to you, O oh God, and pray all of this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, friends, it's time for worship. Let's praise God together. Unrevealed until it sees 
something God of old God to see. Some say, don't give up And hope that your good is good enough Head down, keep on working If you can earn it, you deserve it Some say, push on through After all, it's the least that you can do But don't buy what they're selling Couldn't be further from the truth What if I were the one to tell you That the fight's already been won Well, I think your day's about to Better. What if I were the one to tell you that the work's already been done? It's not good news, it's the best news ever. Some say don't ask for help. God helps the ones who help themselves. So press on, get it right, otherwise get left behind. Some say he's keeping score, so try hard and try a little more. But hold up. This were true, explain to me what the cross is for What if I were the one to tell you That the fight's already been won Well I think your day's about to get better What if I were the one to tell you That the work's already been done It's not good news, it's the best news ever The best news ever So won't you come, come all you weary and you burden, you heavy laden and you hurting, for all of you with nothing left, come and find rest, oh, what if I were the one to tell you that the fight's already been won, well I think your day's about to get better, what if I were the one to tell you that the work's already been done, it's not good news, it's the best news ever, the best news ever, it's not good the best news ever The best news ever It's not good news It's the best news ever Pastor Floor is talking about another name for Jesus, how sometimes she refers to Jesus as a wounded healer. Now, Jesus had scars on his own hands and feet from the cross because he loves us so very much, and how Jesus looks at our scars and hurts both inside and outside and heals us because he loves us beyond measure. So to show you what I mean by that, I'd like to show you this. Ooh, just got interesting, didn't it? So I have this clean, crisp piece of paper here. Its value is 
And there are a number of things that I could trade this piece of paper for that has the same value. Like just to name a few, like I could go to the gas station and I bet I could find a piece of candy or a pack of gum that I could trade for a dollar. Or if I was clever, I could go to the Dollar Tree where everything costs one dollar. But let me ask you, if I were to take this dollar bill and crumple it up, is it still worth a dollar? Or what about if I were to rip it? Or maybe in more than one place, is it still worth a dollar? Is the value of the dollar bill still the same? Could I still buy the stuff that I mentioned before? Of course I could. But let me tell you something cool. Just like this dollar bill, we all have things in our past that have hurt us or have roughed us up a bit, right? We've all made mistakes and we've all done things that God wouldn't be a big fan of. But when Pastor Floor says that Jesus is a wounded healer, that means that Jesus sees our immeasurable value despite all of the rips and tears and crumples. Jesus looks at us like we look at this dollar bill, but even better. There's nothing we could ever do or say to make Jesus love us any less. So no matter what our past holds, Jesus heals us and loves us beyond measure. So let's thank God for that together. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for loving us and for seeing our value, even in times when we can't. Thank you for your healing love and for challenging us to serve and share that love with any and everyone we meet. And now we lift our voices together to say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God's love is for everyone, and this is a time for you to lift up your prayers. God's love is real. It is an important part of worship to receive and give in response to God's love. Prayer requests may be written in the comments section wherever you are watching. Take a few moments to remember the blessings, sadness, or concerns of this past week. As you write or lift up a prayer request, pause, reflect, and listen for what God may be laying on your heart. Take a deep breath and receive God's blessings and comfort through this conversation of prayer. God's love is active and your financial generosity makes it possible for the hungry to be fed, the sick to be supported, and for God's word to be shared. In the comments section, there is information about how you can give if you so choose. And thank you, thank you for what you have already given and for what you continue to do to support the staff, mission, and ministry, which allows Herndon United Methodist Church to serve and share God's love in community. Most of all, let this be a time to continue worshiping God through music, prayer, and word, so that we can discover how God's love might be transforming us and the world around us. Amen. 
and amen. so much for that beautiful music and thank you to those of you who have entered in prayers into the comments 
Sometimes we feel comfortable naming our prayers out loud or in writing, and other times our prayers are things that we hold on to in our own hearts or our own spirits. As we prepare to hear God's word proclaimed, I, I want to invite you to take just a moment to join your heart with mine for a pastoral prayer. The idea behind this is to not name every single thing that we've just seen in the comments or everything that we've just thought of, but to really just open ourselves to who God is and how God might be loving us and loving all of creation through whatever it is that we are experiencing in this time. So let's pray together. God of all grace, I thank you that you have created each and every one of us. I thank you, God, that you have created this world in which we live. There are moments, God, where we witness the fruits of your creation. Maybe it's through hearing the birds chirp, or maybe it's through seeing the grass grow. We look around in this time, and there's so much green. On great days, sometimes there's sunshine and very few clouds. And God, as we look upon your creation, maybe we look upon ourselves and give thanks for all that you are and for all that you have done. Yet, God, if we're being honest, sometimes we need to confess that creation's kind of messed up. It's not your fault, it's ours. We've distorted who you are, we've distorted what you've done. We do that to other people, and God, if we're being real with you, sometimes we do it to ourselves too. And so, God, we're praying that you would forgive us, that you would release us, release us from our former things, release us from what it is that has been, and free us, God, for what will be. For, God, we understand that your business of creation isn't something that we read about in the first chapter of Genesis, never to read about again. You are constantly in the business of creating. You're doing it in us, even now. And so, God, we pray that you might open our eyes and open our hearts, open our lives to what you are creating, to how you are creating, God, to who you are creating. May we see in each of us not our mess, not our, our junk, but, God, instead may we see in one another the goodness of who you are. Enable us not only to see that, but to know that, to live that, and to believe that. And through it all, God, would you be proclaiming over each and every one of us the good news of healing, of forgiveness, of mercy, of steadfast love, and in God more than anything, a grace that is boundless, a grace that you offer to each and every one of us. God, we pray for that grace to surround us and to uphold us, to give us the strength to proclaim those glory sightings and joys, and to give us the comfort to know that we are not alone in our concerns and hurts. Through it all, God, would your love be the way. Let that guide our hearts as we hear your word proclaimed today, and let it guide our souls as we grow ever closer to you in and through your creation. We love you, God. And we pray all of this in your son's name. Amen. Would you please join me in reading today's scripture? Feel free to follow along in your Bible with the words on the screen, or simply close your eyes and listen to these words from John chapter 20, verses 24 through 28. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he replied, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in a house, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here. Look at my hands, put your hand into my side. No more disbelief, believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, my Lord and my God. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. My name is Flora Huidela. I am one of the pastors here at Herndon United Methodist Church, and I am so glad you joined us today. Um, today I'm going to be sharing um, something that has been in the works for 53 years, my life story. And my life hasn't been the easiest one, but uh, that I would not change anything about it. So let me share a little bit about my life with you. I was born in Guatemala City on a Tuesday morning on June 6, 1967. My dad was a very influential uh, man in Guatemala. He worked in the private sector as a very successful businessman and also had business with the government. My mom owned a flower shop and I remember that since I was a little girl. She did that from home. I have a brother. He is five years younger than me. He is married and has two beautiful children. Um, he calls me little sister because he is 6'1 and I am 5'2. I love him so much. I tell him he's my favorite brother. Um, I attended a private Catholic school since the age of five when I was in kindergarten and I did that all the way through eighth grade. Then I went to an American private high school in Guatemala City, where I, uh, I was fully immersed in, into uh, learning the American English language. That's where I learned it. Uh, my dad passed away in 1982 during my freshman year in high school. I was 14 years old. My mom and brother moved to Virginia a couple of years after my dad's passing. We lost all the money and all the properties my family owned, and um, they had to start from scratch. I got married pretty young. Um, as a good Catholic, I had three children before the age of 20, and uh, I uh, just love my, my children. Their names are Rita, Alex, and Frank. Uh, my grandmother, was also a big influence in my life. And I loved her like my own mama. And um, she uh, started attending a non-denominational church in Guatemala. And uh, her daughters were not too happy because she was a little rebel and she wasn't going to the Catholic church anymore. So she would ask me to drive her to church. Eventually I became part of the church and that's where I got to know more about God. A quick, quick note. I used to watch, when I was a little girl, the televangelists, uh, and I remember praying with Pat Robertson and Jimmy Swaggart in Spanish, uh, since I, I mean, since I, I remember, eight, nine years old. Uh, isn't that funny? I was already looking, searching. Uh, but after uh, getting married so young, I got divorced by the age of 22. Um, he found someone else, so he restarted his life. Um, I decided to move to Virginia and join my mom and my, my brother and my grandmother, who, who uh, she moved here too. And I arrived in Virginia in 1992, 28 years ago. And I, that's when I met my second husband. Um, he was an American guy and he was my brother's best friend. Uh, my mom considered him his second son. We got married and we had a child together. His name is Isaac. He is 21, he'll be 22 in October. After 13 years of marriage, I found out also that he had found someone else, but this time this person was very close to my family too close and I was devastated. So I left my house with my three boys. Alex was 15, Frank was 14, and Isaac was four at the time. There was a little problem. I had no documents to stay in the country legally. See, uh, my kids were born in Guatemala and they did get status through my second husband, but he did not give it to me. So, um, it was, it was very painful and it was a big mess. I have uh, attended Crossroads United Methodist Church since I moved to Ashburn in 1998. 
I was a churchgoer who would sit in the last pew and would leave before the service was over because I really didn't want to talk to anybody. Ha! Huh. What a change, right? I started my life with God at Crossroads after my separation in 2003. I started serving in different ministries and began to find myself. Since I didn't have documents to live and work legally in this country, my soon-to-be ex-husband used it as um, a tool, right? As uh, something to hurt me. And sh I was arrested at my place, my place of work. I was working at a dental office and I was an ortho assistant and a dental assistant um, at the same place. That day when I, when I sat in jail, I talked to God and I asked him to please allow me to stay so I could be here in the United States to be with my sons. I told him that I would serve him in any way. I know, I know this, making deals with God is not something that we are supposed to do, but I did it anyway. I was desperate. The journey was very difficult. Fighting immigration was super hard. I had a few immigration hearings. The Methodist Church actually has a ministry called Just Neighbors. And at the time they were able to represent me and uh, they did it pro bono. And it was such a blessing to have in my life. They helped me so much. At the final hearing, the judge was very kind to me and he apologized for all the wrongdoings of my ex-husband. The immigration judge was able to witness and experience the abuse that I had to go through with my ex-husband. That helped my case very much that day. The immigration judge administratively closed my case, but left me in limbo. He told me, ma'am, your lawyer can advise you on how to get legal status. I was crying, afraid, and confused during that last hearing. I didn't understand anything uh, he said because of my state of mind. The only way back um, to um, get status was to get married. The only way that I could get status was to get married. So I got married to an American man again, this time to get documents, but it didn't work out. I started cleaning houses, I started making jewelry, I started doing anything I could do um, to make ends meet. I had to go to food pantries to get food. I had to um, just ask for help wherever I could get it. And guess what? God opened doors for me and I was always able to um, you know, be there for my kids and to provide for, for them. So uh, when I was cleaning houses, I was able to pay um, rent. It was, money was scarce, food was scarce, but I was able to do everything and with God's help. I had a support system at my church. They're, they created a team and this team of beautiful people carried me through those years. And yes, I fought deportation for six years. That team became my angels on earth. But that is the one part of my story where I go back and I say, wow, how did you do that? Let's talk about my call. I served Grace Ministries at Crossroads United Methodist Church and I was the director of Grace Ministries uh, in 2005. Then I started the candidacy process through the United Methodist Church that year too, to become a pastor. I became a pastor 11 years ago, and I was appointed to Crossroads Latino United Methodist Church, which was formed through the community already attending ESL and Grace Ministries. We all got together because there was a need of community for the Latinos. And I remember uh, people asking me to be the pastor, and I would say, no, I, I can't be a pastor. I don't, I'm not, I'm not equipped. That was the word I would use but God had a different plan for me. So in 2005, I got married again. Um, I shared with John my life story and my struggles. He was a good working man. He ha we had a child together, her name is Taylor and she is 14. John had a very dark past. And uh, after a lot of prayers and discernment, I told John we had to separate. My call was to be a pastor. 
My goal was to serve God. And if I had stayed with him, with John, I was not going to be able to serve God in a pastoral capacity. We were married for four years. In 2009, I moved close to the church crossroads where I was still serving and I became a pastor and I got my green card. I served crossroads through the Latino congregation and I served God through the American congregation as well. I was overseeing women's ministries at Crossroads, small groups, grace ministries, and any other ministry. We had a furniture ministry, we had a bread ministry. We had all kinds of ministries that were birthed through the Latino church. And we're, um, we were serving together with the American church. It was just beautiful, a beautiful ministry that I was part of. Uh, if I wasn't a church, I would be doing ministry work. Taylor grew up in a church and she loves church. She is, like I said, 14. I found myself through this life with God, uh, just looking for more, searching for more. And in 2003, I learned uh, about spiritual practices and I learned about how to be in connection and community with God through retreats. And I learned how to be or how to be in intentional silence with God. In 2010, while being in silence, one morning the word awareness came to me. Awareness about my surroundings, awareness about my past and my present, about everything around me. I felt the need to learn more about myself and understand the why of my actions, but mostly the why of my reactions. I recognized that my life story was unique and it was sacred, just like yours. Just like yours, unique and sacred. In March of 2011, I went to Guatemala to visit my mom. She was deported in 1998. And I asked her a lot of really hard questions about my life. Questions were answered and my life actions made sense to me especially the reactions. Memories kept pouring out of my mind and I would just offer them back to God because they were not for me to keep and to drag anymore. And I felt liberated. Before my trip to Guatemala to talk to my mom, I met with Tammy Bond, who is my spiritual director. She helped me, she guided me, and she was there for me every step of the way. I still meet with her when I need to talk to her about something that is weighing heavy in my heart and in my soul. After the search and after I found the woman that God created me to be and not the one that the world formed, after learning to be in silence and to listen for God's voice, after learning how to love myself and to be gentle with myself, I found peace and joy something that I did not have in my life before. I stayed single for four years after I left John. My life was about serving God and becoming the best version of myself. Don't get me wrong, I'm still searching. And this is, this is a search that will be ongoing until my last breath, and I'm okay with that. I, uh, in 2012, while being at Jimmy's Tavern, you know, Jimmy Stavern, with some friends, I met my husband, Steve. I shared my life story with him that night. He shared his. He had gone through a lot as well. We became friends and it wasn't easy for him to handle me because I had learned to be open and transparent and he wasn't used to that. He, I learned to use my voice and to search for the right word so I, wouldn't hurt anybody and I still do that. I try my best. But what, what Steve was different, we were both in a good place in our lives. We had healed, he had healed from his divorce. I did pray for him though. I did pray because I long to have a family, a home to care for, someone to cook for. And I know I had Taylor, but I always had a big family. My sons were older. Alex became a Marine and left home. 
he eventually came back. Frank, my son Frank, he went to JMU. He graduated from Stonebridge High School. All of my kids did. And he went to JMU and graduated. And after graduation, two days later, he drove across country and went to California pursuing his career. Isaac mostly lived with his dad and girlfriend. I was, it was just me and Taylor together. Taylor, I mean, Steve has two amazing kids, Elizabeth, who was 12 when I met her, and Nicholas, who was 10. Elizabeth, mi niña, will be 20 next month, and Nicolatino, mi Nicolatino Bello, will be 18 in November. The kids asked Steve to propose to me and Taylor, so he did. It was a family gathering, and it was just beautiful. All the kids were included, even Alex and Frank and Isaac who were visiting because it happened over Thanksgiving. Um, I can tell you the story, it's, it's, it's a funny one. So um, we got married. We got married uh, in 2013. We have been married for almost seven years. Life hasn't been easy, my friends. Well, uh, but um, having a blended family has been difficult, but we both, Steve and I, both love and appreciate what we have. We made a commitment before God and to each other and to our children. There's no abuse, but respect in our home. There are lengthy conversations instead of loud fights. I am now able to listen instead of just talking and being reactive. My mom passed away in September of 2014. <clears throat> she was my rock. I experienced depression after her passing and I had to take antidepressants. It took a, a two and a half, I had to take a two and a half year sabbatical from the church because as some of you already know, after my mom's passing, my son uh, passed away, Alex. My mom passed away of oral cancer and her death was by far the, the, one of the hard, hardest things I have ever experienced, but then the death of my son was by far the worst. I miss him every day. Steve asked me that day when we got the news about Alex's passing if I was angry with God because of my son's death. I told Steve that, first of all, that thought never crossed my mind, that I could not be angry at God because it wasn't God's choice to take Alex from me. Alex was his son anyway, it is, and it will continue to be, just like you and just like me. But Alex, it was Alex's choice. He made that choice. And within a week of Alex's passing, I also realized that even though my son's life ended, mine had not. I told God that I was going to continue to live my life, this precious life, this precious gift that he gives me every single day. The joy and the peace I have found are mine to own and to live into. The peace and joy that he gave me are from the spirit. And it is something that no one and nothing can take away from me because I have a life with God. My intention, yes, my intention is to continue living my life with God to the fullest. Even when I don't feel well, even if I am down or even if I am sad, I will continue to try to be gentle with myself and forgive myself. And I will do this without judging myself. As you know, we are our worst, our worst critics. My life is about prayer. I pray constantly. My prayers are different each time. My prayers are about giving God praise, about intercession, about gratitude, and about forgiveness. Next week, Pastor Jonathan will teach us more about prayer in our lives and how we need transformation instead of just change. Once you are transformed, my friends, you can't go back.
You cannot. You cannot put the butterfly back into the cocoon. It just doesn't work that way. And that is a transformation I want for each one of you. One of my favorite writers, Henry Nouwen, wrote a book called The Wounded Healer. In the book, Nouwen calls us to recognize the wounding we have in our lives to be able to serve our communities with more compassion, more understanding, and without judgment. We need to search and to look inward to be able to look outward and to serve together. Psalm 139, one through six says, O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I am far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. It's been an amazing life. It has been a great ride. I wake up every day wondering what blessings, because we can find blessings even in the midst of the storm, my life will encounter. My life is a life of prayer. I love to be in silence. I love to meditate. And I, I have learned to love nature to the point that I cannot be without it. For in nature, I have found God. I love my life. I love my life with God. Amen. I am so glad you are here today with me, and I am so glad you listened to my life story. As I have said before, I love God and I love people. I would love to develop a godly relationship with each one of you. And I just, if you, if you are open for it, you just contact me. You can find my information on the website and I will be here to listen to your story and to form a deep relationship through God and Jesus with you. This morning, I would like to give you two questions for you to think about this week. One is, what was your family's faith story when you were born and the influence it had in your life? And the second one is, what do you need to do to live your life closest to God? Let us pray. May the God of love, mercy, and grace continue to be with you. May God continue to guide every step you take this week and shine the precious light of Jesus over your path. Go and live your sacred life with God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.